What's up, Stallions? This is the Poker Cowboy. I hope last week you were able to watch our episode with number 15, 14, and 13. If you haven't, you should go watch that before we talk about this week's number 12, 11, and 10 at the Mattress Max Stable out in Las Vegas, Nevada for the WSOP. We have three members on today's episode. One of them is one of my best friends. Another one is a guy I've been putting into poker tournaments around Houston for the last year or so with great results. And the last one was a guy that had a day five run in the 2021 World Series of Poker. Would he be able to repeat that same run this year? Let's find out now as we run down number 12 through number 10 in the Mattress Max Stable. Bam. So you gotta be the best, but you just gotta keep beating yourself, right? So every day you play, you learn a little bit more, and you go back and, and you figure out what you're doing wrong and what where you can improve. And as long as you continue to improve in areas that that you need to, I think you're being the best version of yourself you can be. So you shouldn't try to be the best in the entire game at any point. You should just always try to be the best version of yourself, and results will follow. Diamond Hands Kyle Aurora is who we will be talking about first. I met Kyle last year when we were at a Houston final table together and he was sitting to my direct left. He would eventually get knocked out by the same guy that knocked me out, the Houston Phenom Viet Vo. For some reason in every tournament we were both going deep and we were always sat next to each other. He busted me out maybe in three or four different tournaments deep in the money. Yeah, we were going at it a lot last year. Anyways, enough about Viet, back to the Stallions. <laughs> Kyle took a really unlucky hand, I remember, against Viet at that final table. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Viet opened on the button with 7-3 off suit. I was in the small blind and folded. Kyle looks down at two sixes in the big blind and ships all in. It gets back to Viet and he asked a question. Oh man, I got myself in a tight spot. I got 7-3 off. Runs the numbers in his head and says, okay, makes the crying call. Of course, Viet being the luckiest person in the world, he is seven in the window and that would be Kyle's exit for that tournament. Well, I knew and I saw how great Kyle played all tournament and I knew that he had to be a part of this team. So asked him to come be a part of the team. We were down playing a WPT main event in Florida and we went to dinner. He was at dinner with DJ and Will Wynn and I and we were talking about this upcoming summer and I actually just had a spot that came open. And so I asked Kyle, I said, Kyle, you know, I know you've had a great year. You had a day five run in the main event last year. I really think you'd be a good fit for this team. I really want you to be part of, you know, reviewing hands with everyone, talking hand history, talking more GTO with a lot of the guys. He was excited to do it. He was real eager to come out here. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to have the same deep run in the main event, but he did still have some good runs. And he played a lot of tournaments on his own, and he also played a lot of tournaments on the stable. Unfortunately, he wouldn't find success in either of those. My favorite moment this summer with Kyle was right from the beginning. He got there a little late and jumped in the first tournament for the summer for him. It was a $1,500 six max no limit tournament where he would end up cashing for about four times his initial buy-in. So he was off to a good start for the summer and that momentum would not last. But in the race, it's not always how you start, it's how you finish. We're starting off with Kyle Aurora. His biggest cash was actually in his very first tournament that he played on the stable. He cashed for $6,723. He played a total of 21 tournaments worth $55,800, and he cashed for $16,691, bringing him to $891 left in his bankroll for the summer. Sonny Sundara. Honestly, he was staying next door to me in the suite for the majority of the summer and I think I might have seen him three or four times besides to give him money for tournaments. He was always in a tournament. If he had bust out, he was looking for the next tournament. So Sonny's biggest strategy this summer was to play the smaller fields, play the smaller buy-in tournaments, and build up his bankroll in those to be able to play some of the bigger tournaments and you know not be able to feel the effects if he blanks out on those. So he ended up playing the most tournaments in the stable and he also was working full time while out here in Vegas. He would be up in the morning, working through the morning on conference calls, on Zoom meetings, and then he would go down and register a tournament. So a lot of some of the bigger noon tournaments he, he couldn't play because he was working in the morning. So he'd be playing the nightlies, the five o'clocks, the three o'clock afternoon tournaments, the bracelet events, or playing around town at the Wynn the Venetian. Whichever tournament had a good one, Sonny was there to play it. Uh, Sonny was on this team because uh, Sonny and I have a relationship back in Houston where I've actually bought pieces of him in a bunch of tournaments uh, all around town and he's 
done nothing but provide me with the good returns on my investments in him. So I know he's a good tournament player. I also know that he likes to fire as many bullets in as many tournaments as he can. So we know how expensive that can get with all these tournaments and that the tournament cycle is just up and down, up and down. I do feel lucky to have caught some of his success in Houston on the upscale. Unfortunately, this summer, he had the most caches, but in the big tournaments that mattered, he was unable to reach those big caches that we all dreamed about. My favorite moment with Sonny on the felt was when he was making his deep run at the end of the summer in the 777 event. He was able to get deep, but like all these tournaments with these huge fields, they're very top heavy. And if you're not at the final table, the money doesn't really make a huge significant impact on your summer. I wish that he could have made it a little deeper. He uh, ran into some tough hands late. And Sonny plays in a very aggressive, crazy style. So it only takes one hand for him to lose his spot in the hand or lose where he's going. And that could be his ultimate downfall. I say that that could be his downfall, but that's also a way that Sonny's able to build chips and able to close out a lot of these tournaments is he takes these huge risks that are very unconventional and people can't put them on a hand or a play. Next, we have Sonny Sandara. His biggest cash was also in his very first tournament he played on the stable, the WSOP Freeze Out, for $6,550. He was the player that played the most tournaments with 71 tries, and he also ended up tying up with Logan with 12 caches to bring him to the top of that list. Sonny's buy-ins totaled $66,165. His cash outs totaled $27,116, bringing him to $961 left in his bankroll. Stallions! Prime time primo is the next person we're gonna be talking about. So Primetime is originally from a different part of Texas, but in the last few years he moved down to Houston and it's mainly for the cash game scene and the PLO and how great it is in this city. But he's also been a tournament player for a long time. I've known Primo for over 10 years. We used to play tournaments together uh, back before PLO cash really started taking off in Texas. I've known Primo a long time. I know what he brings to this team. I know he loves talking hand histories. I know he likes reviewing with players. He has a great strategy and approach to the game. I've always respected his approach and how he wakes up, makes sure he eats right, makes sure he gets his exercise in and goes about his day. So his one mission is being in this tournament, being there during prime time, which is the final table. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make a final table, but my favorite prime time primo moment was when he was only 50 people away from getting first place in the monster stack. It was a million dollars up top for that tournament on only a $1,500 buy-in. So it was very exciting when it gets down to six tables left and one of your teammates is still on there. So, oh he, man, dude. Godly, it got me again, but it was a good run. He was the first deep run of the summer. I uh, would we'll say deep run is final 1% of the field and he was in the final 1% there and it was just amazing. Just uh, every hand counts and I know after it and the hand he busted out on, it was a tough hand. He had ace jack with enough flush draw on a board and uh, ace king just held against him. So tough spot against an aggressive player that he was in the hand with. He uh, took a line against an aggressive player that he wouldn't have taken against a tighter player. So that's just what poker is. It's the variable that GTO doesn't explain right there is the ultimate variable is the other player, you don't know what they're gonna do. No computer knows what they're gonna do. It's the human element. How you adjust your strategy, how you adjust your GTO strategy, all depends on the variable across from you and that's the player in the hand with you. My favorite off the felt moment with Primo this summer was when he rewarded Stephanie for all the hard work she's been doing all summer. He bought her a candy bouquet and brought it to her while she was on the computer all day working. I'm helping the guys with everything we needed this summer, whether it was our flights, our food, our tournament buy-ins, our bankroll management. She was there 100% and the guys noticed it and Primo took an extra special uh, notion to give her something to say, hey, you know, I appreciate everything you're doing this summer for all the guys. And that really made me feel good because Primo is a great friend of mine and he spends a lot of time with Stephanie and, and me off the felt. Uh, he could see that, you know, we were going through a lot and we had a lot on our plate this summer and just to be rewarded by the guys and, you know, for them to recognize that really felt good. 10th place goes to Pageman Niati. His biggest cash was in the WSOP Monster Stack for $20,888.
He played a total of 49 tournaments on the stable, totaling in $78,144. And in cashes for the summer, he had $40,925. That brought him to $2,781 left in his bankroll. So last week we talked about a side bet briefly where Fireman Scott was my partner. This week I need to explain that side bet to you. 14 of us that were at the stable from the beginning decided to draw partners and the two of us would compete against the other two man team to see who could have the most money at the end of the summer. Every man would put up $1,000, which would make the first place team get a grand total of $10,000 and the second place team get a grand total of $4,000. After we did our random drawing, Sonny Sandaro would be paired with Will Wynn, Bob Cote would be paired with Logan Hewitt, Jerry Yen would be paired with Matthew Colvin, DJ Alexander would be paired with Matt Bray. My partner would be the Fireman Scott. Kyle Aurora would be partnered with Primetime Primo. And the final pairing would be Chris Birchfield and the Cosmonaut Dave. So follow along and see whose numbers added up and who would win the side bet. Hey Stallions, I hope y'all enjoyed this week's video on the number 12 through 10 spots. If your favorite Stallion hasn't popped up, please tune in next week. We got number nine, eight, and seven coming at you. And also stay tuned on the Poker Stallions channel. Subscribe and like so you can find out what's next for the Stallions in Houston and where we're going. Go Stallions.